Okay, it's one o'clock. I think we're missing some stragglers from lunch-related stuff, but uh, that them's the breaks. Either you eat or you do Drupal. You gotta choose one. Um, hi, I'm Jeff. Um, if if you have run into me in the Drupal community, um, you'll probably know me as Eaton. Um, I will be your ranter for today, uh, or at least for the next hour or so. I'll try to be friendly as I rant, but I will probably gesture vigorously and make enthusiastic and sometimes exasperated noises. So apologies or welcome, join in if you'd like, whatever. Um, I'm with a company called Lullabot. Um, again, you may have heard of us. Um, we we do cool stuff and we work with Drupal. We've been doing it for um, years and years and years and I, I lose track of just how long, but we have fond memories of Drupal 4, which is sobering. Um, we work with um, large, small clients. Um, we work with companies that are building large websites, are maintaining hundreds of websites, um, we do public training with um, individuals who are building their own home sites or who've just been hired by a company who said, hey, we're doing Drupal, and they have to learn how it works and all kinds of stuff, um, which is um, sort of like saying, hey, we're awesome. Okay, it is. Um, but one of the things that I think has been interesting about the work that we've been able to do over the past five years is that we have worked with a really wide range of people inside of the Drupal ecosystem. We're a relatively large company in like the small to mid-size world. We're about 25 people. Um, but we've worked with companies ranging from like, you know, multinational conglomerates who want to roll out 200 plus site multi-sites for Britney Spears and stuff. Or um, a guy who's literally running a local website for his small town's businesses so they can post specials. And it's been a really interesting experience being able to, on an ongoing basis, talk with lots of people on both sides of that spectrum. Um, and that has at least to some extent helped shape a lot of the way I see the Drupal community. It's um, that there's a really, really large spectrum in there. Um, also. Um, of late, we've launched a video, an online video training service called Drupalize Me, which we find is getting an even more interesting mix of you know different people who wouldn't even be coming to like training workshops and stuff like that. But they say, hey, yes, I would like to use Views. I would like to watch a video of Views. Let's go. Um, so it's very, very interesting. Um, just as an FYI, um, this presentation is going to be full of opinion. Um, there will, in fact, be several facts, um, but if the stuff that I'm saying here is anything that you disagree with or you feel that I'm missing something fundamental in the way that I'm understanding or like seeing the Drupal community, um, let's talk about it. Come on to Drupal.org, start a conversation. Ping me via email, go to groups.drupal.org or whatever. I mean, we, we encourage this kind of stuff um, for talking about code or for architecture or for, you know, what's our next big initiative or feature push in Drupal. Um, but we really don't necessarily have a culture of understanding ourselves. We sort of have a culture of saying, oh, I'm me. I do this with Drupal. That's what we do with Drupal. We do this thing that I do. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily conscious, but I think we all have a very strong tendency of projecting the way that we approach Drupal onto the whole of a really, really large and extremely diverse community. Um, and the topic today that I'm gonna be talking about is technically about the difference between Drupal as a framework and Drupal as a product versus Drupal as like a platform that people build on. Um, but I think really the deepest question that underlies those things is who is Drupal for? What kind of people, what kind of users of Drupal are we really imagining when we try to build stuff and we try to imagine a course for the future? Um, so to start off, um, this is Bob. Um, he is my cheesemonger, and he is awesome. Um, I can walk up to a little shop um, in the town that I live in, and he will tell me, oh, a guy named Willie just brought a bunch of cheese wheels out of this cave in Wisconsin, and I 
got some. I know you're going to love this. I'm like, oh, awesome. Thank you, Bob. And it's just great. I love cheese. Um, I found out uh, about two years after I started going to his cheese shop that he has a Drupal website. I didn't even know he had a website. But then he was like, yeah, yeah, I've got a website. And a friend of his made it for him. And he's got one. And I looked, and I was like, hey, that's garland. That's yellow garland. And, and there's a cheese card instead of the Drupal head. And that's his website. Um, he doesn't even know what Drupal is. But to some extent, he is using Drupal. He is an audience for Drupal. And there are actually a really, really large number of people whose experience with Drupal is at that level. They use it as someone who occasionally knows they should like log into their website and update stuff or tell their customers about something. Um, and it's important to him because he wants to tell people about new cheeses coming in or specials that they can you know, use. It's not like he doesn't care, but for him, he's caring about a particular goal. He wants to engage with people. He wants to have a website because he knows that's important. Um, but it's just a friend of his that happened to recolor Garland and set up a website for him. Um, sort of at a different point in the spectrum, this is somebody named Heather. Um, she ran on a, bl a blog that got really popular, and it ended up getting its own sort of side community of people who commented on it, and she started up a forum for it, and now people have lots of forum discussions, and she wanted to sort of take this community website that she managed to the next level, and she hired someone to help her build a Drupal website to do that, and to sort of help with the technical side of managing it. Um, this is not, Heather is not someone who's like a technical, you know, oh, I don't like technology, you know, just make me a website kind of thing. She, she really cares about how it works, um, but also building websites is not what she does. It's not what she is passionate about. She wants to get to a particular place. She has a community. She wants to manage it. She wants to engage with it, and she wants people to be happy with it. And she hired somebody to help her build a Drupal site to do that. Um, this is uh, somebody that you may have actually seen wandering around a couple of different Drupal cons. Um, his name is Eric. Um, just out of curiosity, has, has anybody here ever watched Mystery Science Theater 3000? Okay, there's a couple of people. It, it's uh, a television show that ran in America for like seven years or something and got this cult following. Um, it's just like silhouettes of two guys, or like three guys in a movie theater heckling a movie. And they run terribly bad, like 1970s movies, and they heckle them. And that's the show. And it's, people love it. Well, the show, got, the show ended up ending, and now they do digital sales. They sell MP3s of the heckling so that you can say, awesome, I have a copy of Inception, and I want somebody to make fun of it. And you can get the MP3 for the Inception heckle track, and bam, you have your night with fellow geeks set. It's ready to roll. Um, Eric is the guy who manages their website. Um, it's built with, I think, Ubercart. Um, it's, I think, running on D6. Um, and they, they love it. They really like it. Um, he runs an e-commerce site. Um, he, has, he writes code, um, and he even donates back some of the modules that he's written for this. There's community engagement going on, um, but it's also in a different kind of way than we're, than we're often used to talking about at DrupalCon. It's not like he's diving in and working on new core patches for Drupal, or he's the person who is the maintainer of such and such module, and he's not at a shop that's going out and, you know, well, we've got these clients we're building websites for. He is a person who is the caretaker for a particular website, and he curates it and manages it um, both on a code level and like a, oh, somebody's orders didn't get processed right, I've got to take care of that kind of level day in and day out. Um, this, is, this is Larry. Um, you may have also seen him wandering around uh, DrupalCon, um, perhaps gesturing vigorously and arguing with other people. Um, he is a software developer. Um, he works for a, a Drupal shop that builds large websites for large clients, um, Palantir. Um, and he also is a very, very heavily active core Drupal developer. He is one of the people that actually makes Drupal. Like, we download Drupal core, and he has been a part of 
creating that thing. Um, from his perspective, like Drupal is a tool that's used to build things for clients, for the company that he works for, and it's also something that he pours a lot of passion into. Like the actual making of Drupal is something that he's very passionate about and he cares about, both for professional reasons and I think on aesthetic, you know, as, as an aesthetic issue. You know, it needs to be good because we're making this. Um, I promise we'll, we'll be through the bios in a little bit, but I think, I think it's interesting. As I've started compiling some of these different things, realizing just how diverse people who care about Drupal and have a stake in it are. Um, this is John. Um, he's actually the editor of The Economist. Um, I'm, I would put money on the fact that he doesn't actually care what Drupal is. Um, he may know of Drupal. He may know about Drupal. Um, his magazine now runs on Drupal. Their website is a Drupal website. Um, but he doesn't care about it in the same way that Larry cares about it. And he doesn't care about it in the same way that Heather, who runs her community site, cares about Drupal. He wants his editorial staff to be happy. And he wants the magazine's website to not go down. And he wants it to be able to, you know, do the things that their advertisers say they need to do. I mean, it, it's, it's very pragmatic interests that he has in Drupal, I'm willing to guess. I don't know him personally, but we can imagine his, his desires, I think. Um, but again, that's, that's a very different set of needs and desires from any of the other people. Um, this is somebody else, um, it's a friend of mine, her name is Emma. Um, she has actually been in the Drupal community longer than, a, I would say, a fair percentage of Drupal people, like probably 2004 or so was when she really started getting involved. 2003, oh, okay. So basically, she can, she can shake her get off my lawn kids <laughs> cane at all of us. Um, but she also works with Drupal at a level that is totally off the radar for the vast majority of the conversations that we have as a community. She trains people to make websites for under $1,000 with Drupal. And you know the whole concept of the long tail that you know Amazon and Netflix Instant and all that stuff have pioneered, um, I think should at least have established the idea that there are a lot more people in that long tail of I need to make a website and I can't actually spend as much as I spent on my car for it. There's a lot more of those people than there are editors of The Economist. It's not that one is more important than the other, it's just they're very, very different. Um, and like this is one of the sites that she ended up um, either building or helped one of the people that she works with build. Um, it's Essentially, like, is it a food co-op? Um, something along those lines? That one is actually my election site. Oh, okay. I'm, I had a screenshot of the food co-op site. Okay. Um, that's the confusing thing about greens. You think, oh, greens. Sounds like a salad. No, it's a party. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Americans, um, this, is, um, this is Barack. Um, he, he works at an organization whose office employs probably several dozen people to build a website for him, and it happens to be a Drupal website. Um, again, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he doesn't actually have a whole lot of personal vested interest in um, the new database API or whether we, not, whether we ship a really good install profile with Core or not. Um, on the other hand, he has a really huge vested interest in Drupal working and being good at what it does. Because as it turns out, if um, Drupal is insecure and something goes horribly wrong and, you know, a giant picture of a kitten gets uploaded to the front page of the White House website, nobody's happy. Um, and being able to do the things that he needs to do in order to communicate to an entire country essentially. The way his website needs to support that. It's a whole class of needs and desires and, and criteria for deciding whether or not this works that's just in a different universe from a lot of the other people that we've been talking about before. Um, I think the really important takeaway with this is the idea that all of these people 
are actually really actively participating people in what makes Drupal, both in terms of directly participating in our community in, in these engagement kind of events like DrupalCon, but also um, in shaping the future direction of Drupal, both in terms of hiring people to make things happen because they need them to happen, um, or just agitating and saying, hey, we need this done or whatever. All of these people have an interest um, and their needs differ dramatically from each other. Um, the biggest challenge that I think we face is that all of these different needs that these people have, we've spent a really, really, really long time working very hard to make all of them very, very happy. We can probably kill one of those varies. Well, maybe we've just made them very, very happy instead of very, very, very. But you know, we, we, our, our goal has been to make everyone thrilled. Um, and we're actually hitting a point where a lot of that awesome low-hanging fruit, the things that we can just do to make everyone thrilled, um, we've harvested a whole lot of it. And we're at a point where we have to start making difficult choices because the things that help one of those constituencies, the people who represent my cheesemonger, stuff that make him really, really happy with the Drupal that he experiences, are very different from the things that make the editor of The Economist very, very happy, or that make Larry Garfield, who wants our APIs to be pristine and good and solid, very happy. Um, it's not that we have to decide who we like and who we don't like. It's not that we decide which one is important or not. It's that we have to start asking, how do we prioritize these choices that we make? Um, because our attempts to avoid making these hard choices. Our attempts just to help everybody simultaneously have been killing us with complexity. I've spent probably the last year like presenting and writing about the complexity cost of the way that we've been approaching Drupal. Um, and that's actually, it's a really serious problem. I mean, Drupal 7, I think, is about two and a half times larger than Drupal 6, and just in terms of like the size of the download. And the problem isn't you know, how many K you have to transfer over the wire to download Drupal, it's we have a community that actually manages and maintains this piece of software. And as it gets bigger, that means it's harder for us to do that. It takes more work. This isn't like the end of the world, but it means that we can't just keep adding complexity to satisfy everyone simultaneously without killing ourselves. Um, which brings us back, I think, to that first question that was the product slash framework slash platform thing. The question that at least hypothetically is, you know, what this presentation is about. Um, I, it's probably not a big secret at this point that I think that question, the split of whether Drupal is a framework for developers or a product for end users, is a bent, has been a really hot topic and has come up a lot as a potential way of resolving some of this tension. Um, before I take a strong position on that, I want to at least like set some ground rules for what I'm talking about when I use the word product and what, what I mean when I say framework. A product is something that helps you do something. Your goal, well, okay, there's some people whose goal when using an iPhone is to use an iPhone. It's like, I just really like it. I like tapping on things, yes. Um, but at the end of the day, a product is something that you use to get to an end goal that you care about, that you value. WordPress is popular not because people really, really love a piece of software named WordPress, and clicking on it and typing on it is just thrilling. They use it because they want to communicate with people, because they want to blog. It's a product in the sense that it is focused relentlessly on people who want to blog can use WordPress to blog. It has a mission statement that is basically three words long. You should blog. There's not really any confusion around that. And there are other kinds of products, obviously. I mean, you know, games, software packages, stuff like that. But ultimately, even products that can be extended and built on top of and stuff like that, the real key differentiator is that kind of focus on a specific, narrow, articulatable goal. And make everybody happy is not a narrow goal. Um, on the flip side, you've got frameworks. These are things that you use to make products. 
like a box full of tools. Yes, there is enjoyment that you can derive from like woodworking and stuff like that. But even people who are doing, say, woodworking and really love that are usually making a chair or making a table or something like that. They are creating something that has a purpose, not simply shaving wood shavings because it's just really fun. Um, Again, I don't want to exclude anybody who just really enjoys wood shaving, so I, I won't make that a 100% statement, but it's, it, it's a big difference um, between that product mentality of, of focus on an end goal beyond the tool versus a tool which is for making products for people. Um, it does get a little fuzzy sometimes because a tool is a kind of product for people who make products. You know, you could say like, oh, well, my, you know, an IDE that I, that I write Drupal code in, I bought that, it was a product, I use it, and I'm very happy with it. But, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not a framework, it's, it's, it's code. The, the distinction here isn't code versus design or UI versus the database or the guts of the program or whatever. It's what is the purpose of it? What is, you know, how narrow is the design and the purpose, and can I even articulate that? And if we look at a framework as tools that you make products with, I think that can help us clarify things a little bit. I keep pointing my remote at the monitor, not my computer. That doesn't work at all. Um, the third one that I don't think has gotten as much discussion in the Drupal community is this concept of a platform. Um, the idea of a platform is kind of fuzzy. Things like, you know, the LAMP stack that we run Drupal on traditionally, that's a platform. Um, people talk about the Windows platform or, you know, the iOS platform for people who want to write apps for, you know, iPads and iPhones and iThingies and stuff like that. Um, but beyond just software and beyond just operating systems, stepping back, the idea of a platform is, it's a thing that lets you use products. It's an enabling piece for those products that people actually care about. So like the person who wants to blog, LAMP is a platform that allows them to use WordPress, which is a product. And their end goal is still that final destination, that thing that they want to get to. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an operating system, but it's this idea of an enabling piece that's very important, but isn't necessarily their focus. They, you know, again, people don't go out and buy a new version of Windows or a new version of you know, Mac OS or something like that just because they're thrilled about changing the version number on a piece of software. It's because of things that it gets them and things that will be built on top of that that they want to take advantage of. Um, just out of curiosity, does anybody remember a piece of software called uh, HyperCard? I love you people. Um, it was launched in about, like I think, 1987 by Apple, and it went out, it shipped free with ev like every single Macintosh. Um, it had this metaphor of like stacks and cards um, that you could, like you basically had a paint program that you could make things. You could make the background and then you could make the foreground and then you could put little clickable transparent buttons all over it and it would take you from one card to the next. And people ended up wiring up amazing things with it. Like the first wiki, like Ward Cunningham, the guy who made wikis and then it ended up you know, talking about patterns and everything. Um, the first wiki was actually a giant hypercard stack that he made. And eventually, when like the web started taking off, he made a website that was the equivalent of that. Um, anybody remember the game Mist? Okay, yeah, no, Mist was a giant hypercard stack that they had a little bit of custom code they jammed into it that let them use color. Ooh, color. Um, hypercard triggered a really huge explosion in sort of homebrew do-it-yourself software. Because under the hood, not only could you use paint tools, you could start attaching scripts to those buttons. And you could learn its little scripting language. And you could wire up behaviors with things. In a lot of ways, it's very similar to the kinds of, the kinds of things that people end up doing with Drupal when they enter via that, I just need to do a thing. 
So, and I heard I can use CCK to wire this stuff up and views to wire this stuff up. And then they learn a little PHP because, well, they need to make this other thing work a certain way. It's got a lot, of, um, a lot of similarities. And I think the passion of the community around HyperCard is very, very similar to the kind of passion that the Drupal community brings to bear. Um, it ended up being canceled in like 1992, essentially. And until the mid 2000s, there were still people writing hypercard stacks and like having meetups and like just vigorous about how much how awesome this platform was that's staying power um and i think although i'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it i promised myself i wouldn't just use this as a memory lane nostalgia thing um i think there are a lot of very interesting metaphors in hypercard's history for drupal's future uh, one of them is how difficult apple found it to figure out who hypercard was for was it for office managers who wanted to run the lighting systems for their skyscraper? Was it for a kid who wanted to do a like, stack of cards about the solar system? They didn't really know because it was kind of for all of them. And that was a really, really difficult challenge. Um, which I guess brings us back to, I think, an underlying question of what Drupal is. Um, has anybody seen this optical illusion before? OK, a couple of people. Um, Depending on how you look at it, it's either a rabbit or a duck. It's kind of like a framework slash product. Um, Drupal faces a lot of that problem. I mean, the, the question of whether or not it should be a product for people who want to do a thing or a framework for developers who want to build something um, People can't even answer what it is now, because it's both, simultaneously. Developers build stuff on it, people download it, and without writing a lick of code, assemble things with it, um, which is cool, but also challenging. Um, it's challenging because we have to make compromises on every side when we pursue all those directions. Drupal, the product, um, at its worst moments, um, ends up looking less like an iPhone and more like an old 1998 era phone duct taped to a cell phone, duct taped to a credit card. And um, the real problem isn't that it's got too much stuff duct taped on. It's, it's just we need to hire a good themer. That's what we need to do. That's a theming problem. You could theme it to look like an iPhone. Just, you know, just budget for a themer. Um, and then there's Drupal the framework, this toolkit that we talk about, all these APIs, all these, you know, things, these robust things that you can build anything you want to on top of. Make web apps with Drupal, anything. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, once you actually start working with it heavily and really trying to customize it in those kinds of directions, it ends up feeling less like a giant box full of tools, and more like the world's most complex Swiss Army knife ever. Using that to untighten a bolt or something means that you also have to figure out what you're going to do with the magnifying glass and how you keep the tweezers from popping out and all that stuff. Um, and then the solution is you can just use hook knife alter and you could just hide the fact, you, you, oh, no one will even know there's a magnifying glass in there. Um, you know, we love it. I love it. It's what I use day in and day out. But at the same time, it ends up sort of being like the platypus of software. Um, it's a product, a uh, pram work, something. Don't even really know what to call it. It's, it's sort of a mutant amalgamation of the product needs and the framework needs and all of this stuff glommed together. And the downside is, is that everyone ends up suffering for that. The guy who just wants an iPhone to take pictures with and make calls with is carrying around an, an old brick phone strapped to a camera. And the person who just wants to carve something awesome out of wood has to flip out that one tool from the giant El Grande Swiss Army knife. And everybody's a little dissatisfied. Um, I, you know, it's, I, guess it, I guess it might be a little impolitic at DrupalCon to say, God, that sucks. Um, but quick show of hands, how many people work like professionally day in and day out with Drupal? Okay, how many people have felt that at some point? Okay, there's like six people who are like, no, no, I'm pretty cool with it, you know. But I mean, it, it, it is a significant point of pain in our community that the choices that have benefited one group sort of continually 
pull on the other group in uncomfortable directions and then they tug back and it, it, it's, it's difficult. Um, so I think one thing that I wanna, wanna step back real quickly and look at is how we actually got here. How did we get to the point that we have this weird mutant amalgamation software that's being pulled in all these directions? Um, um, everybody's like heard the Drupal origin story, right? You know, Dries and you know, a bunch of his friends had like a dorm in 2000 and they needed shared internet access and then they made a message board in PHP and they started adding features to it and they were, you know, messing around with it and, and uh, that, that's Dries in, in I think 2000 or 2001 with an excellent sombrero in his dorm. Um, that is sort of where Drupal actually originated. Like the classic, we had a small community of people who wanted to communicate and share news and information. And this was like the era when Slashdot was like three years old and the hottest new thing. And you know, the coolest thing you could do with your software package was like add comment moderation, just like Slashdot had. And you know, RSS feeds were a bold new initiative. Um, and the New York Times' front page on the web looked like that. Yeah, that was pain. Um, Drupal evolved a lot during that period of time. Um, Drupal version 1, 2, and 3 were released inside of a period of about a year and a half. And pretty much the whole thing got rewritten over and over. It was, it was an open source project. It was people messing around with code and enjoying it and doing something cool and building something essentially for themselves. Um, now, I don't know if anyone noticed, but up there in the corner, there's a couple of little people symbols. That's, um, that's a running tally as this time counter increments of how many active developers there were on Drupal.org versus how many active user accounts. Like the number of people who had accounts on DO and were in some way participating versus people who were building Drupal. And we could say, well, was that core? Or was it contrib? And in 2003, there wasn't any contrib repository. <laughs> we didn't even have modules that, that weren't in core. There was just Drupal, and you could turn stuff on or off. And if you wanted to, you could hack it by writing up some code and dumping it in a folder called modules. That was Drupal at this point. Um, but this is when actually things started taking off in interesting ways. Um, has anybody heard of Kernel Trap? It's a site that basically followed like Linux software announcements and releases, and um, it was one of the very first sites to start using Drupal. It was essentially, as far as I know, the first site launched on Drupal that wasn't one of Drupal's own developers doing their own site. This was like the first transition out of, yeah, I needed to make a site, and I wrote the software for it. It's called Drupal. Um, other people were using it. Um, and right around this time, a little later than that, is when The Onion ended up converting to it. It's a satirical newspaper in the US that like, is relatively popular in the sarcastic geek circles. Um, they converted to it, and it was a big deal at the time. Um, and even more interesting, at least to me, is um, the Howard Dean campaign. Has anybody heard about the Dean campaign in the US? Yeah, he's like, yeah, Dean! Um, he, he ran for president in the United States um, during the 2004 election campaign. But what's really interesting is that um, his campaign really wanted to leverage social media and leverage the grassroots connection concept as a part of their campaign. And one of the things that they wanted to do is they wanted to have a turnkey website that somebody who was running like a local Dean campaign could just drop in and turn on and have a Howard Dean campaign website. And they hunted around and a couple of people, somebody named like Neil Drum and you know, a number of different people who were involved in it, found a piece of software called Drupal. And they made something called Dean Space that was basically a heavily, heavily hacked copy of like Drupal 4.2 or something like that, that any one of their campaigns could just drop in and turn on and they had a campaign website. And I think this is, this is really, really a part of this era of Drupal sites. It was still people who would have otherwise been writing their own 
CMS or hand rolling some sort of crazy PHP scripts or web code or whatever, um, but they found Drupal and they said, huh, okay, well, we can use this as the starting point for our community site or our communication or whatever. Um, and this is about the time when the first third party modules started getting released. There was like path module and an Amazon API module so you could link to products on Amazon. Yay, there are modules. Um, that was about it. Um, the next sort of big wave came around like 2005 or so. Quick show of hands, how many people here were in the Drupal community around this period of time? Okay, so yeah, it, it's, the, the numbers start growing where it's no longer like weird tales from the distant past. There's people who remember this era. Um, and as you can see from the little count of people symbols up there, um, you know, the developers, you know, we, we like grew by 50% in that era. Um, but the number of people who weren't active developers also was growing a lot faster. Um, this was also the first DrupalCon. Um, 12 people, I think, maybe 13 people met in the basement of a bar in Antwerp and said, yay, it's DrupalCon. <laughs> I think we may have boffs that are that small here. Um, this is when like Drupal 4.5 shipped and there were a staggering 300 modules in Contrib. Just how could you even know them all? There were 300. But you know, there were hardcore geeks who would like say, yeah, I've downloaded them all. I've done them. What modules do you work with? All of them. Um, and you know, people talked about there being thousands of Drupal sites at this point, whole thousands. Um, and this is when the concept of Drupal as more than just code that coders wrote so that they could make their website, it being more than just that, that really started emerging here. Um, that basement of a bar meeting that was the first DrupalCon, that's where people started brainstorming about something that they called the content construction kit. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to write a new module from scratch every time we needed a new kind of content. Um, because, new, because kinds of content was a relatively new concept at this point. Nodes had arrived on the scene about a year and a half ago. And immediately they started thinking, well, we need different kinds and it needs to be easier to make them. So as far back as 2005, the ball was starting to roll for brainstorming, trying to build tools that would allow them to, without writing code, do these things and build out a Drupal site. This is actually when a lot of the older shops in the Drupal world started emerging, like Advomatic, um, Civic Actions, um, Ping Vision, Four Kitchens, Lullabot. You know, this was like the era when some of those earlier shops started emerging because they realized, oh, well, a couple of us could like actually, you know, get jobs building Drupal sites for people. Crazy, huh? Um, this was the, when the concept of the site builder, a person who wasn't a dev but could go and build a site, really started emerging and started taking off. If we move forward to like about two years, 2007, um, yeah, that's when things really started taking off. And again, these are numbers that I got from Drupal.org, like number of people working on Contrib, number of people working on patches for Drupal Core, number of people active on Drupal.org. Um, Again, we, all, we a little over doubled the number of devs in that period of time, but I think we either tripled or quadrupled the number of people who weren't devs and who were operating in that site builder capacity. People who, would take the, who could take the tools like views and CCK and just assemble a working website. Now, a lot of them would quickly run into gaps that they had to learn some PHP and figure out how to like spackle in the odd, you know, missing bits and stuff. But it really was a significant, significant shift. Um, and that's when Drupal 5 got released and a year later Drupal 6 got released and people were starting to grumble about how long it was taking because, you know, man, it was actually longer than a year to get Drupal 6 out the door and man, I just don't know if we can put up with that kind of weight. Um, <laughs> Um, but we also saw a huge adoption of Drupal sites in this period of time. Um, I think some of the interesting stuff that went on, like you know, Popular Science Magazine in the U.S., Fast Company Magazine in the U.S., Britney Spears website, you know, was became a Drupal website. The first Drupal book, 
uh, that was focused 100% on Drupal got published. And we're like, hey, we're real. Printed matter talks about us, which is funny and novel now because you can actually die under the load of a full bookshelf of Drupal books at this point. But you know, then it was like, sweet, paper. Um, and this is when niche shops in the Drupal community started emerging. Um, Curve, um, Moshe Weitzman's company, who um, they focused entirely on my Dr Drupal data migration, um, just recently acquired by Acquia. But this is when they got started. Like this was when the idea of niches in development and site building started becoming viable. Top-notch themes. What they do is theming. They got started around this period of time. Um, but at the same time, we were also starting to face like greatly increasing amounts of complexity. Um, the small pieces loosely join concept of just assembling a website out of these 80 different pieces started turning everybody who thought they could just click things together into like a Drupal integration specialist who had to troubleshoot whether or not a particular version of CCK and these five field modules worked with a particular release of views. And then Drupal 6 came along and they had to rebuild all their views from scratch and then they had to figure out C tools because then there was a dependency and oh and there's token but what about if you know I mean this is when the actual complexity of even just using the point and click tools in Drupal started ramping up and we started having to deal with that as a real problem. But at the same time, Drupal was really becoming popular and huge numbers of sites were converting to it and that's actually when the concept of Drupal as like a really serious actual cash flush market. People with actual checkbooks wanted to pay people to make Drupal websites or to work on Drupal. This really changed a lot of things. Um, this is when Acquia was launched. They were the first venture capital funded Drupal company, which was this sort of sobering, oh my gosh, we're really real now. Not only are there books, there are investors. You know, it's crazy. Um, but again, it's this scaling up trajectory that we were on. Um, and then you hit 2009, and um, again, the number of those little developer symbols still growing, yay. On the other hand, um, the comparison in percentages to um, the rest of the active, participating, site building, involved in Drupal, invested in Drupal community, is starting is getting really really out of whack here the issue isn't that like all of these people are somehow like free riders who aren't carrying their weight or something like that it's just the natural growth curve of all of these developers building something for themselves and then starting to build tools like views and cck that save themselves work and then suddenly this whole other crowd of people finds it incredibly useful i mean we can hardly blame people for finding it useful um, but the numbers are actually even a little more sobering because I had to change the scale of this group versus that group for there to actually be a filled in person on there. The actual percentage is roughly one third of a little person symbol actively working on Drupal development. That's sobering to think about. Um, but at the same time, we were also starting to focus on things like usability testing. This is when like the first round of real actual serious usability tests for Drupal, of putting like non-developers in front of it and actually recording what the heck confused and angered and baffled them. This is when we started doing that and it was really sobering. Um, I think Dries um, did a keynote in which he had a video of someone doing eye tracking tests on like one of our admin screens. And there was this ha 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 for like the first 30 seconds as the eyes went around trying got to find the button. Where's the field? I don't know what's going on. And then it was like minutes of this person just staring, trying to figure out where just a single field was. And that's when we started getting serious about usability because we didn't want to have an, an ugly, uncomfortable eye tracking <laughs> video like that again. Um, but again, the rest of the community is also sort of humming along at this period of time too. Um, using Drupal, which, you know, shameless plug, I co-authored, it, it was a book that was written 100% for people who were site builders, not developers. There was not a lick of PHP in it. It was just site building recipes for people who wanted to assemble sites out of Drupal. Um, that's also when the, web, the White House website went on. You know, Barack Obama's website launched and it was a huge, huge deal. 
But again, this same trajectory that we were dealing with two years earlier of the nice little cul-de-sac that we lived on where all the people who made Drupal could walk out and wave to each other as they got their newspapers and go in and write their patches um, was turning into like a, a, a nine-level, you know, multi-turn pike highway. We have infrastructure problems. We have infrastructure problems managing our infrastructure problems. I mean, it, it, we're big. We're big and our community has grown massively. This is around the period of time where tools for managing Drupal complexity started becoming really popular. Things like features, um, Agar to manage multi-site deployments, um, real attention on the role of install profiles, which had actually been talked about as early as like 2005 or 2006 and went into Drupal really early. Um, this is when it actually really started bubbling up in people's minds. It's like, my God, we really got to do something about this. Oh, and I'm running along. So I got I to gotta cruise through this. I apologize. Um, but then all of these big infrastructure problems, all these big challenges going on, but at the same time, the percentages of who seemed to be really sunk deep into the guts of Drupal and working on it and building it was really out of skew for how many people who had a stake in it. The people who, you know, the results of what that little tiny group of people were doing ended up rippling out and mattering to all of these folks. So, what's the point of all of that? Um, the tension between all of these different groups is not a new thing in Drupal. People who want a site building product to assemble a website versus people who want to write code on top of a nice little framework. Those tensions aren't new. In fact, they go way back to the early days when the first non-Drupal developers started building websites in Drupal in like 2003 and 2004. And a lot of the themes just keep reoccurring. This devs versus builders thing is one of the issues that we keep perennially referring to um, as like a big conflict in Drupal. Um, like, the Drupal 7 upgrade, um, builders are incredibly frustrated that contrib modules aren't ready, that suddenly their toolbox for working with this awesome new version of Drupal has actually gotten dramatically smaller and they have to figure out how to make it happen. But devs, on the other hand, are incredibly frustrated that so much of core has changed and it's so much work to port their old modules and suddenly there's that 80 gajillion people clamoring at the door saying, why is it your module upgraded? And meanwhile, the core developers are saying, hey, look, core is much bigger. You know, why don't you help us instead of working on your talk like a pirate module? Hey. I love talk like a pirate module. Um, I mean, it, this, is, this is a classic challenge of lots of different groups that care passionately about something, that it matters to them having different needs and different struggles. But there are a couple of other things beyond just devs and builders, too. There's this concept of like newcomers to Drupal versus those old timers, people who say, oh yeah, Drupal, it's a community, you know, you just go into IRC and you say, hey, and you toss out an idea and somebody says, yeah, that's great, let's make a module. Yeah, well, but that was also like 2004. There were like 100 people in IRC and everybody complained about how busy it is. And then we split into four channels and each of them has 600 people now. That's not the same kind of thing. You know, getting a grasp on those kinds of changes, it's really hard for the people who've been around for that long, whose formative concept of Drupal was some devs building software because they needed it. And the newcomers are saying, hey, this feels exclusionary. Why can't I make a dent in this community? I come into a room full of 600 people and I wave my hands and I shout and I've got a problem and I can't even get anybody to answer me. And maybe nobody noticed because it was just loud. There were 600 people in the room. This is a challenge. They've got different needs and different even views of what the underlying fundamental problem is. Um, another interesting one um, that uh, Blake Hall, uh, one of the developers at Lullabot, um, has mentioned is the conflict between shops, like Drupal companies that build sites for other companies or for other people and then move on to the next website that they're going to build versus site owners, the people like Eric at, that, at the beginning of the presentation, who their job is to own a site and carry it through. It's like raising a child, not, you know, babysitting somebody. Um, 
that's a big difference because the needs of those site owners, you know, the whole don't hack core, well, yeah, that's a big problem for shops that are moving from site to site to site to site because the next site that they come and work on, if it's been hacked, well, how are they going to, oh, it's, it's going to be a huge pain. But for a site owner, you know, look, I'm babysitting the site for the next six years. If I need to make changes to it, I'm going to make changes to it. I mean, it's not that one is better or worse, it's just that they're dramatically different perspectives on what the challenges and the needs are. Um, enterprise versus like independent websites and independent developers, that's another one. Like, you know, who can even really define enterprise other than like really, really big and important? I mean, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and again, the needs of the White House's website are very different than the needs of my cheesemongers. That, you know, that shouldn't be rocket science, but it's like those are two significant pools inside of the community that are at odds. And then there's the classic like hippies and capitalists, which is my favorite one. Um, this sometimes corresponds to the newbies and the old timers thing, but the idea that you participate in Drupal because it's an act of love. And we all are this community and we make our code and we give each other our code and we dance around the DrupalCon costume guy and we have a good time and, you know, that's awesome. And we've built tons of stuff with that too. But there's also a significant pool of very pragmatic, yeah, but I also need to eat and my kid needs to eat and I've got two people working for me who are writing that code for you and love to do that dance around the DrupalCon guy and I need to pay them and we need to figure out how to make this make money. Again, it's not that that's like, oh, the soulless people have invaded. It's just, it's become large enough that they are actual genuine stakeholders and they're actually helping pay for the hippies. So it, it's a big, it's a big crazy mix. And again, it comes back to this idea of different people with different perspectives and all of them being heavily invested in Drupal. All of us are invested and we can't actually afford to just jettison any of the people who are a part of that mix because we need all of them. We need to actually have real difficult decisions in the Drupal world about what we're targeting and who we're trying to serve and how we're going to actually serve that broad mix of people. I think there are a couple of different options and thankfully now the slides are moving a little faster so we should be good. But one of our options for this is from the perspective of the, of the people who actually build Drupal, we could just stop. We could just like say, Drupal is officially mature software. Drupal core has the features it will have. It's done. We will do security releases. We will, you know, maybe, eh, you know, do some minor updates if it stops working with a new version of IE or something like that. But everything else, it, it happens in contrib. And it happens in the world of developers building on top of that and the enterprise clients who need to customize it in some odd way or whatever. It's mature software. Now, you know, the downside of that is um, it's hard to actually get people energized and engaged about something that you've officially said isn't going to change. And, you know, in the world of the web, it's hard to get new developers super jazzed about something that you said you've just poured concrete over and it's just going to stay that way forever. But at the same time, you know, it, it's, that's a valid possible solution to this. Instead of killing ourselves to keep doing more and more and more and more to satisfy that broad range of people, we can just draw a line in the sand and say everybody gets to build stuff on top of that, whatever you like. I'm not actually in favor of that, but the daiquiris on the beach sound like an awesome, awesome option. Um, another, another possibility is just say, forget it. We pick one of those core constituencies and we say, that is who Drupal is for. Forget site builders. They've served us well and they've been a strong part of the community for, you know, seven years or whatever, but forget it. We are a development framework. We're going to be like Django in PHP or we're going to compete with Cake. Or alternately, we are now an enterprise level like content management solution for your intranet or your extranet. I'm not hearing like thrilled noises from the, you know, I mean, it, but the thing is, is like these are valid choices. We can just say that particular pool of stakeholders in the world of Drupal, that's who we're for and we're going to focus on that and we're going to actually be good at helping them 
instead of trying to help everybody at the same time. And everybody else can use WordPress or Django or whatever. The, the thing that we need to keep in mind is we're not doing anybody any favors by just saying, no, 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 it's for you, and it's for you, and it's for you, and you, and you, and it's for everybody. Um, because that ultimately gets us to the other option, which is just keep working harder. The real problem with Drupal is that Angie doesn't put enough hours in. <laughs> yeah, no, I, <laughs> I actually think that Angie may have act, Angie Byron Webchick um, has actually developed working time distortion technology, and she does work for 29 hours per day before napping. Um, that's my working theory. Um, and there's actually a lot of people in the Drupal community who pour that kind of insane energy into this. Um, and ultimately, that's what it takes if we say that the solution is just keep targeting everybody and just work harder or work smarter or whatever. More of what we're doing is not sustainable. It's not scalable. Randy Fay um, is doing a really, really good core conversation on the problem of burnout in Drupal core development and Drupal community development. It's a serious issue now because, I mean, you can't infinitely please an infinitely expanding group of constituents with one pool of people. It's really hard. Um, it may be theoretically possible for the smartest people in the universe to come up with a, a single solution that satisfies everyone but, you know, that's like in the realm of what philosophers argue about over beers, not things that I think a sane and healthy community can try to tackle effectively. You can't just keep that going. It's just adding more and more and more plates, and that dude is just going to get fried. Um, a fourth option, and this is, again, one of those terribly, terribly ugly things for our community, is we could say just fork it. GitHub has a button for it. It can't be morally wrong, um, except the fact that there are different constituencies out there, and some of the people who are most frustrated by certain kinds of things, developers, they have the skills to just go and write their own. They could write Frupal or whatever they want to call it. Just fork it, customize it. They've got a different vision. They can go in a different direction. There's not anything fundamentally evil about that. We've talked about it like it's evil, but really it's just a management headache for the Drupal world. We could even encourage it, say, hey, if you don't like the direction we're taking with our catering to dog walking businesses in Drupal, then you can just fork it. Hey, it's cool. Um, there are, however, significant downsides to this. We've got this problem of multiple constituencies in our community depending on each other. And we can't just jettison one of them. You know, if the enterprise people leave, a huge, a huge source of targeted funding for major improvements leaves. And huge high-profile sites that demonstrate to us that, yes, we can scale, and yes, we can do really complex design tasks and stuff like that, that goes away. But if we totally say, forget you to the huge pool of one-off site builders and small, in small fish, I want to make my cheese blog types, on the other hand, well, the numbers that drive Drupal in a lot of ways, the adoption curve that makes Drupal appealing to lots of developers and even lots of large businesses, that goes away. And if the developers leave, well, we're back to sipping daiquiris on the beach because how long is it going to take to train a completely new ba batch of people how to keep writing patches against form API? You know, it, it, we all kind of depend on each other. And saying just fork ultimately is a way of telling other people, well, we're not going to kick you out, but you're welcome to leave. Um, that can be problematic, too. Ultimately, I think the best solution that is there for us, the most promising solution, is to accept that the needs of the developers who want to build stuff, those old school people who would probably be writing their own CMS if they hadn't found Drupal and discovered that it did 80% of what they needed, those people do need a framework for building software that happens to be a web CMS. But at the same time, that huge pool of people, that giant mass of little gray person symbols that we saw, they don't need a web app building framework. What they need is tools to build certain kinds of websites, or tools to manage their communities, or tools to, say, 
run a web comic or whatever. They need those kinds of things. The good news is that we actually have the capability in Drupal of building those kinds of products on top of our framework. We call them install profiles. We do, they're the redheaded stepchild of Drupal. Everybody says, oh, it's install profiles. Yeah, go play. Hold on, we've got stuff to do. Um, we could do this, and I honestly think it's one of the most promising approaches that we have, allowing us to divide our software down the middle inside and say, these are products for people, and this is the toolkit that we use to build products. I think that's really promising in part because, one, all of the other choices that are available to us that I can see alienate other groups inside of our large conglomerate community that we actually need. That whole we can't afford to just kick out 50% of the community issue, well, treating it like a platform is at least a way to figure out how we can appeal to multiple constituencies without just building one monolithic thing that tries to make everybody happy. And the other issue is, you know, we can kind of say we've got our cake and eat it too. If we start moving product focus and, oh, well, if only we made the WYSIWYG editor 15% prettier, then, well, you know, maybe that's the kind of stuff that goes in a product that goes into an install profile that customizes and configures the Drupal framework for a particular class of end users who have a particular actually describable use case that we could build against. Those kinds of things sort of, they let us have our cake and eat it too because we can build those products using the toolkit but they actually get treated internally as separate things, not just a big bundle. So I believe I have negative three minutes. Somebody can yank me off the stage with a hook if they want to, but I've got like three more slides. Um, the first thing that we need to do is agree on the actual goal. I've been saying what I think our goal should be, you know, that framework with products built on the framework as install profiles. I think that's a legitimate goal. Having an ecosystem of that kind of approach I think would be really useful. But we have to agree on a goal. Some critical mass of us have to get on the same page about that. Because we've always, as a community, been great at tactics and horrible at strategy because we refuse to acknowledge that there are all these different constituencies pulling in different directions. So we treat each little tug on the rope in different directions as a specific tactical issue that, oh, well, it's this patch. That was just, that was a hard patch. Or, oh, well, there's just arguments between these two modules. We don't acknowledge that it's a higher level strategic question that we need to address. And I think doing that and being honest about what we're doing, that we are trying to answer these questions is really important. The other part is, basically stepping back and organizing ourselves internally. Like the actual Drupal software, we have to figure out in this thing we call Drupal core and Drupal contrib and stuff like that, what are the pieces that are really products and what are the pieces that are toolbox things that we use to build stuff. Poll module is not a piece of framework infrastructure. It's a feature for a product that I think a lot of people like but it's one of those things that lives in that, oh, you want to do community engagement. We've got polls to go with that. It's not, so I need an API. Yeah, but I'm going to need polling. You know, it, it, it lives at a different place in that layer. And I don't mean to pick on poll module, but it's a really good example. Things like forums, blogs, et cetera, all live in that area. And I actually kind of, I, I finally conceded this. I used to champion something called small core, which was basically, you know, we, we wanted to trim Drupal down to size so it was manageable. And then profiles would just emerge in the wonderful future. And I'm willing to acknowledge that I think that's not going to happen that way because we need to actively cultivate and grow those product-focused profiles. They don't have to be like massive open atrium levels of customization and tweaking. But even just saying, yeah, we ship with a profile that's pre-configured for single user blogging and that's what it's pre-configured for, nothing else. Or we have, a user, we have an install profile that Core ships with that is for a small community website that wants to post news for members and is managed by four to six people. Things like that that we can describe as products, if we can cultivate those, both in terms of the work to put them into Core, but also encouraging and actively promoting and encouraging the people working on them in Contrib and treat that as 
a very legitimate piece of the Drupal ecosystem and a critical one, I think that cultivation is something that's gonna be very important for us because we need to do that before we can ever afford to start shaving stuff off of what we think is Drupal core. Cutting off features that site builders need is not going to magically make something for site builders grow over here. But if we build something that appeals to them and work on the framework, and our purpose is to sort of work on figuring out where those lines of separations are for now, we kind of have to accept that there's gonna be temporary bloat in Drupal core, because it's gonna be getting features. It's going to be adding profiles. We're building more on top of Drupal core in that period of time, but that's temporary. The long-term goal is to be able to say, okay, three years from now, four years from now, that community management profile that ships with Drupal core, maybe that becomes a separate distro that can get its own three or four customized modules and not just have that as something that's jammed into core. Or maybe there's a large number of other profiles that are actually people's on-ramp into Drupal rather than just downloading Drupal core and doing other stuff on top of it. Um, the idea of spinning off viable products that can survive as legitimate standalone downloads that people want to use for their own purposes, and then keeping the framework as this toolkit that we use to build those things, I think that's really, really promising. Ultimately, the question of whether or not Drupal is a product or a framework or a platform, I think is really easy to answer, at least for me. Drupal is a platform. It has a framework. Internally, we build products on top of the Drupal platform, either for ourselves, because we're devs who want to make websites, or for our clients, or for our peers, or for our family members. But the sites that we build, and even the reusable models for sites that we build, those are products, and they're built on top of it. Drupal is a framework, or Drupal's framework is the shared toolbox that we use to make those products. Right now, our core download is both in one but I think if we try, we can actually see what parts are what and begin to improve them as what they should be, not just terribly duct taped together things that we pretend are one. We don't have to abandon one group, we don't have to abandon another, but we need to at least acknowledge that there are different needs and start treating it like that, frame, like that platform with different internal components. That's all I got. Drupal's a framework, Drupal's a platform, Drupal's a product. Let's, those words are too easy to mix up. Drupal's all of them, but if we treat it like a platform, we get a lot of benefits, and I think we can make a lot more headway to pleasing people without killing ourselves. So let's treat it like one. That's it.